Are Intel actually releasing a flagship desktop CPU in 2021 with just eight CPU cores? Apparently so, and that's exactly what we're going to be reviewing today. This is the new i9-11900K, and it's part of Intel's new Rocket Lake 11th gen desktop CPU lineup. And I wanna see how fast this thing is versus the 12 core 5900X from AMD, and also the previous gen from Intel, the 10900K. So what exactly does Intel have to offer here? Let's take a look. So first off, let's take a look at what's new with Rocket Lake. Well, thankfully, it's not just another Skylake iteration. Although it is still 14 nanometer, it's derived instead from Intel's 10 nanometer Ice Lake parts, just backported to a larger process. In terms of what that looks like, in terms of products, specs, and pricing, it's actually pretty similar to what we've seen from last gen, except for that i9-11900K that we'll be reviewing. Instead of the 10 cores that you'd find on the previous gen 10900K, we've now downgraded to just eight, with clock speeds honestly looking pretty similar as well. And pricing actually seems to have gone up versus the 10900K. All right then, so really the only advantage here over the 11700K is that you get some additional clock speed out of the box, you get a higher default memory spec if you're interested in that, and potentially a better binned product if you're looking to push some manual overclocking. In my opinion, the most interesting products in this entire stack are the i5-10600K that we'll be reviewing tomorrow, and also the $160 i5-11400F. The reason for that is that memory overclocking is now completely unlocked across all of Intel's new 500 series motherboards. Now that is a step in the right direction. Now as typical when it comes to Intel's higher end desktop CPUs and the ones that typically consume a little bit more power, uh, there is this discrepancy and debate of which power limit settings to use and test with. And this isn't just a debate between uh, reviewers and consumers, but also between motherboard vendors as well. What is considered a stock power limit on an ASUS motherboard, for example, is gonna be a different experience on an MSI or a Gigabyte or an ASRock board. The discrepancy is typically when it comes to this limit here, the long duration power limit, and whether this will be enforced to Intel spec of 125 watts, or be completely unlocked, or maybe even be set to some value in between. As you can see, Intel's spec of 125 watts sustained has the 11900K sitting below 4 gigahertz flat for all cores in Blender, but not imposing that limit has it sitting significantly higher at 4.8 gigahertz. Strangely enough, that unlocked power limit is actually what is considered stock here on the MSI Z590 ACE motherboard that I used for testing. That is simply loading up the BIOS and loading optimized defaults. That's automatically what is loaded as stock. So to be consistent with my previous testing, I'll be running the 11900K here with the limits unlocked. If you consider that overclocking, that's completely up to you, but it is the out of the box experience here that you'll get on a lot of Z590 motherboards. And before you actually pick a of whether this is overclocking or not, just know that it seems that Intel themselves can't decide which values to use for these power limits. In a recent media briefing, they compared the 10900K at 125 watts to the new 11900K at 250 watts. But even with the limits completely unlocked, shoving over 200 watts into the new 11900K isn't enough to beat the previous gen at 10900K in Cinebench due to that 20% core and thread reduction. Even just with this single benchmark, you can probably tell how this review is going to pan out. But switching to a single working thread only, it's a bit more interesting. There's a huge gain now over the 10900K, and now we've actually caught up to the single threaded performance of the top tier Ryzen 5000 CPUs in Cinebench at least. Other than that, for real heavily multi-threaded CPU workloads, eight cores in a flagship part is just not enough. When AMD are offering 12 cores and 24 threads in the 5900X, which should be about the same price as this new 11900K, I mean, they're really is just no comparison. The new 11900K gets slaughtered in pretty much everything here. One application where the 11900K did poke through though was in Adobe Premiere Pro when encoding 6K footage only using the CPU. To be realistic, this is something that you'd be much better off leveraging to an RTX GPU for, same with Blender if I'm honest, but for CPU only encodes in Adobe Premiere Pro, there does seem to be an improvement here worth noting. Still though, that improvement only makes it two seconds faster 
over the 12 core 5900X. So for production workloads, it is an absolute bloodbath and we could sit here and break down the numbers, but I think you guys get the picture. Eight cores in 2021 for a flagship desktop CPU is just not going to make up any ground against AMD when you're literally up against CPUs with double the core count. However, it is clear that Intel have positioned this CPU as a gaming focused product. So let's see what the picture looks like there. Well, kicking things off with Death Stranding at 1080p, we've got a pretty solid 11% improvement here over the 10900K. But at the same time, that's only enough to basically tie the 5900X. When we drop the resolution to 1440p, they're again pretty much tied, with the improvement now over the 10900K shrinking to about 5%. Another slower paced single player game here is Red Dead Redemption 2, where the 5900X actually manages a slight lead at both 1080p and 1440p resolution. It's not very often that you see a new CPU released, which is then beaten by the competition in both gaming and production workloads, but that's exactly what is going on here. Switching to Rainbow Six, where we see extremely high frame rates north of 400 frames per second, the new 11900K pretty much matches the previous gen flagship. Also, realistically, the perceivable performance here is probably going to be the same for almost all CPUs shown on this chart, but it is useful for testing at least. At 1440p, frame rates are lower, but still above 300 FPS, where the 11900K tops the chart. And I don't want to minimize the efforts or gains here and say that it's worthless, but from a consumer's point of view, it's just not going to make a meaningful difference to the gaming experience. Then we have Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which shows the 11900K about even with the 10900K in terms of average FPS, but with better frame rate stability on the low end. And then switching to 1440p, they're about the same with a tiny lead here over the 5900X. Then lastly, F1 2020. At 1080p, it's essentially tied with the 10900K with pretty much the same picture at 1440p. So at this point, I thought just maybe there was something promising hiding under the hood of the 11900K. Maybe overclocking would unlock the true potential of this product. After all, this is supposed to be a better binned 11700K. But unfortunately, overclocks that were possible on more than a few 10900K samples that I've tried previously just couldn't be enabled here on the 11900K. Maybe it's my particular CPU sample or the motherboard, but I am interested to see the overclocking results from other reviewers. For now, I can't really enable anything worth testing in terms of overclocking. All right, so if you feel deflated after seeing those numbers, I mean, I can totally relate. There is just no reason that I can recommend this uh, to you guys. In production workloads, it gets absolutely smoked by the Ryzen 5900X. And even in gaming, which I guess this is supposed to be a gaming focused product, but it's at best maybe a couple of percent better than the 5900X on average. In some games, it does get beaten. In many ways, this feels like a step back from the i9-10900K, which is a CPU that pretty much became irrelevant upon the release of the 5900X. It's clear at the enthusiast end of the desktop CPU market, Intel doesn't have anything to offer just yet. They've called this thing an i9, but it just does not live up to that tier of product. I think the mid-range is where the 11th gen CPUs are going to be a little bit more exciting, especially when paired with a 500 series motherboard, which can enable memory overclocking. Uh, so that should be a little bit more exciting than what we've got right here. Stay tuned for the 11600K review going up tomorrow around the same time. As always, a huge thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.